perfect. That was uh, excellent. I, I wanted to be to be sure. Thank you. Thank you. Hajun, I would like to introduce you, Edgar Sarayago. He is the director of the Directorate in Studies Development of the Zacatecas University, and Arit is the secretary of the research investigation of the UNLA University. Mm -hmm. Together, we are fostering this lecture, and we're working on this network in the studies of development in Latin America with yeah. Dr. Vincent, who will be here in your lecture, the most important thing is to listen to you, but to be the kick in the studies of critical and heterodox development studies, not such uh, mainstream view of the development economic. It will be great pleasure to listen to you for this network. So thank you and welcome once again. And I'm sure, Aritz, maybe you would like to express something, or Edgar. Go ahead, Aritz, and then I'll continue. Well, uh, simply thank Ha Hu Chang for his participation. It's a pleasure, it's an honor for the university to have you here. Thank you, Rene, for this link. And we're here to work to coordinate and to learn, of course, this great personality for the contemporary debate. Likewise, Dr. Ha Hu Chang, nice to meet you. It's an honor for us in the development studies of the National Mexican University. Much of your literature, we take it and we provided in our studies and our courses of the development. It's a great moment for the academic sector, your work, of course, and we hope to have this synergy of work beginning with this network, with this heterodox critical view that has an a comprehensive view apart from our new narratives regarding the process of development. It's a pleasure. Gracias. Okay, so when will we let it, uh, everybody will let us know when we are ready. To begin the lecture, I will make a countdown from five to zero. And when we get to zero, you are ready to start, okay? Perfect. So we'll wait. Five, four, three, two, one. Good afternoon, everyone. Good, good day and good evening for those in Europe. It is for us, for our university, an honor to have with us Professor Hayung Chang, who is a leader, a global leader in the uh, development studies, development economics studies. We will surely listen to some very important uh, topics today within the theory of dependence framework and also in connection with innovation and technology. The professor is one of the most renowned economists in the world. He is specialized in development economics. He is often um, called a heterodox economist, but he is mainly a pluralist economist, a follower of Schumpeter, uh, Fisher, and many, many other economists, major economists. 
and is mainly focused in looking for solutions, not theories, for the um, ailings of our countries. He has received several awards. He was born in South Korea and has studied in Cambridge University. And he usually uh, refers to his life story in relation to the different transformations of development and uh, speaks about the case of South Korea, who is one of the leading countries uh, in, in terms of uh, its development. He has studied, studied political economy, graduated in 1986, and he is a doctorate from the Cambridge University. He leads the Center for Development Studies at Cambridge University as well. He, is, he has an uh, immense work, thousands, uh, hundreds of articles, several um, dozens of books, and in Latin America, it's uh, very important for us in terms of understanding the industrial policies of the political economy. And since he has been addressing um, very important issues such as intellectual property, uh, science, the advances of science is one of his most um, renowned books, Kicking Away the Ladder, has been reproduced to uh, dozens of languages. And uh, we have several uh, books in Spanish uh, as well, like uh, Bad Samaritans, The economy, Economics for 99% of the Population, which mainly deals with analyzing the economy from a general public point of view without all the technicisms. He has also written with Antonio Archioni a very important article on the development theory. I would like to mention the audience that with this seminar, we are trying to foster the creation of a network, of a Latin American network on the development studies, not only with a neoclassical perspective, we are speaking, of course, of the doctorate degree studies, and in collaboration with the University of Zacatecas in Mexico, the University of Quilmes in Argentina, the doctorate degree in development studies of the University of Venezuela, which is a pioneer center for the debates of modernization, structure, structurally school. Also, the program from a university from Brazil created by Lula in connection with the Industrial Center of Sao Paulo, and also uh, the um, where labor economics of the university, uh, the labor economics um, program of the Campinas University. Students from all of these doctorate programs are participating in this seminar. And also, I forgot to mention the uh, University of Buenos Aires Social Sciences program. So the issue that um, we'd like to address today is the theory of dependence, the paradigm of dependence of Latin America, both for the region and globally. There are some actors like Katikum which point out that science not always leads to advancements objectively, objectively speaking. And in terms of development, it is argued that the new programs 
not always um, address the new problems, but the prior ones. So in this, in our region, we are increasingly noticing um, policies aimed at reducing poverty or increasing income the re or the restrictions to the corporate sector instead of treating structural um, changes, the dynamics of capitalism, the restrictions, the, the barriers on exports, the technological barrier. These issues should be addressed by the political economics, uh, f focusing on where the power is um, placed. Some are still in effect, some approaches. There have been several interesting debates in terms of um, the development theory, some issues related with global capitalism, leading to the to, to increasing inequality the restrictions, the financial restrictions as uh, the main uh, limit to growth and the view of dependency from outside of the region as well. But also we are trying to address the problems stemming from dependency, political dependency in terms of the foreign groups, uh, a dependency that comes from inside instead of from abroad. This dependency is, of course, uh, cross cuts all of these sections. And I have been, I have, I have had the chance uh, to submit a national development plan recently. This led to um, President Correa, Rafael Correa, and the, the proposals, uh, and this proposal was based on Hayung Chan's proposals, of course. All of these perspectives regarding dependency theories. We should remember that despite the importance of the dependency theory, we should also think about the uh, climate situation, the state, um, the, the role of the state today, other problems in the political field that we are facing, the influence of China and its impact on Latin America. So clearly, this perspective is still in effect in all of the aspects that we need to work on within the framework of this new millennium. This is a global perspective that we're facing. Maybe we can call it heterodox in terms of the mainstream economics. But faced with the political economy analysis done on the region, this is very relevant. The debates that have come up are very, very relevant. They constitute social demands in Latin America um, with these concepts of uh, increasing living standards, for instance. So doubtlessly, I am sure that the most the important uh, professor, academic professor globally, is here with us today. And I'm sure he will provide us a very interesting perspective in terms of the dependency theory within the framework of today's technologies and sciences. And in terms of the um, process of this industrialization, I think Professor Hayung Chan has been uh, discussing these issues 
for a very long time within the framework of the countries that are trying to um, develop the developing countries that come from a low point, so to speak, and want to uh, grow. So with this, I would like to welcome Professor Hayu Chang. It is a real honor and pleasure to have you with us today. Thank you, uh, Renette, uh, for that very kind introduction. Uh, yes, I'm uh, very uh, honored uh, to be in this uh, conference. And indeed, uh, this is very turbulent time for all of us, but especially in Latin America. And when you think about it, uh, Latin American countries have been at the forefront of capitalist uh, development. So it was the first countries that were colonized by uh, capitalist uh, imperialist uh, forces. The Latin American countries were actually the first countries uh, to adopt free trade, not out of free will, but under unequal treaties imposed on them in the 1810s and the uh, 1820s, after they became independent, you know, the British uh, that, uh, that adopted free trade only in the 1960s. Yeah? So actually the first countries that, 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 that had to practice uh, free trade was uh, the Latin American countries. In the 1930s, it, uh, that was, uh, uh, the continent was the first continent where, you know, economic development in the periphery started in the form of input substitution industrialization. And in the 60s and 70s, uh, that, that effort was uh, that, uh, criticized by you know, theories that developed uh, within Latin America, the structuralism, but uh, more importantly, dependency theory. And then from the 1980s, it uh, 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 made a U-turn to, to neoliberalism. And in that context, I would uh, uh, say that uh, Latin America was, you know, mas uh, papista que el papa, you know, more Catholic than the Pope, you know, that it was uh, the region that imposed the most extreme form of uh, neoliberalism. And then we had uh, in the 2000s, the so-called pink tide, which had, uh, has, uh, been uh, pushed back, but then uh, has uh, come back in the, the many countries, you know, Bolivia, Argentina, and importantly, even in countries which had that uh, stuck to uh, neoliberalism, there have been changes. You know, the Chile is uh, going into uh, presidential election in which uh, the, the left wing candidate, uh, Gabriel. Boric uh, might uh, eventually win. I don't know whether he will. You know, Colombia, I mean, who would have thought that uh, Colombians would uh, be protesting on the street against uh, neoliberal policies? You know? Peru, the, the narrowly the elected the, uh, left-wing uh, president. So, you know, the, this is a very kind of uh, the exciting, but uncertain time in the Latin America. And I think it's uh, that, uh, very good that uh, this uh, research group has uh, decided to rethink uh, the, the, sorry, the, the reflect upon uh, one of the most uh, important theories that have come out of uh, Latin America, the dependency theory. Now, Rene has uh, introduced me as a pluralist economist, and I genuinely believe in that. You know, I, I don't, I, I, I am often called heterodox economist, but that I don't like the term because it's a relative term. You know, if you're a member of the Orthodox uh, Church, eh? Russian Orthodox Church, uh, the, the Pope in Rome is the heterodox guy. Eh? It's a relative term. You know, I don't try to define myself in relation to anyone else that uh, be neoclassical or Marxist or whatever, I believe that uh, all economic schools have uh, uh, important uh, things to say. 
they all have uh, strengths and weaknesses and their validity that uh, will depend on exactly how you apply them rather than some you know, essential uh, theoretical structure. Yeah? So I'm, I'm but, uh, starting from that uh, perspective and, and uh, the, it is uh, from uh, that perspective that uh, I also understand uh, dependency theory. I think uh, the dependency theory has some very important uh, the strength. Yeah? First of all, a structuralist thinking. Yeah? Of course, that this was inherited uh, from uh, the schools that influence uh, dependency school, like uh, Marxism and so-called Latin American uh, structuralism. So the, the, the dependency school has uh, the, the emphasized that economic structure, both in terms of sectoral specialization and property relations that underpin that, that uh, specialization matters in determining the development uh, path of an economy. Now, this uh, issue of structure is uh, completely ignored by neoclassical school because uh, they have this uh, view of the economy, which is uh, very uh, homogeneous and simplistic. So in the 1980s, when the, the, there was a big debate on industrial policy in the United States, I mean, the, the familiar line uh, from neoclassical economists is that uh, it doesn't matter whether you produce uh, microchips or potato chips as far as uh, you make more money. Yeah? So that, that kind of thinking that, you know, in the end, everything can be translated into common monetary unit. The more of it that uh, you have, uh, the better it is. It's uh, totally devoid of how different structure of the economy, both in terms of technology, but also in terms of uh, property uh, relationships uh, affect uh, the, the evolution of the economy. Second uh, strength of uh, the dependency school uh, was that uh, it uh, has a genuinely global perspective. You know? When I was an undergraduate student uh, in South Korea in the early 1980s, the thing that uh, most impressed me by it, uh, about dependency theory is this uh, the, kind of a uh, proposition that peripheral countries, countries in the economic periphery are not undeveloped, but they are underdeveloped. Mm -hmm. They are the product of capitalist uh, the, the development on a global scale. You know, before the reading dependency theory, I that, uh, didn't realize that. Mm -hmm. So it uh, that emphasizes that uh, how developing countries are, or the, the peripheral countries in its own language are the product of capitalist development in the center countries. So the, the different parts of the global economy were intertwined. And it that, that emphasizes the, the importance of uh, the international division of labor in which uh, the center countries specialize in manufacturing, especially high, high technology manufacturing and the periphery countries specialize in the primary commodities. Huh? And when you think about it, uh, even many primary commodities produced in the periphery countries are not natural, huh? you know, I mean, the Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, Indonesia, these are main the producers of uh, cacao. Eh? But cacao is uh, from Mexico. Eh? You know, Malaysia and Sri Lanka that produce a lot of rubber, but that's originally from Brazil. Kenya and India produce a lot of tea, but that's originally from China. Argentina and uh, Uruguay produce a lot of uh, the beef, but the cattle was uh, imported from Spain. Eh? So in a way that what a lot of people think are natural endowments, natural products are the result of someone else's industrial policy. The British stole rubber from Brazil, took it to Malaysia, set up rubber plantations, 
imported that the, the indentured laborers are from India. Yeah? You know, the, 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 the Dutch uh, that, that took uh, coffee, which is uh, originally an African crop, uh, to Indonesia, and was that uh, at one point uh, the, the biggest uh, producer of uh, the coffee. Yeah? You know, the, the British uh, the stole the, the tea from China, brought it to the, the India and Kenya, and created all these uh, tea plantations. Uh, so even nature, yeah, even natural resources are actually not uh, very natural. Yeah? So I think uh, this uh, global perspective that uh, makes us understand the evolution of uh, the peripheral economies in the, as a, the, the part of this uh, the, the bigger system is very, very important. And thirdly, the dependency theory, this is that, that, that the influence from Marxism basically the, had a very politically oriented understanding of the economy. Yeah? And indeed, this is what economics was in the beginning. Yeah? Economics was at the, in the beginning called political economy. Yeah? Karl Marx, uh, David Ricardo, you know, the Adam Smith, they all wrote about political economy, not economics. Yeah? Economics is the uh, notion invented by the neoclassical economists uh, who wanted to turn the, the, the study of economy into a science, yeah? a project uh, that is uh, deeply problematic. Uh, we uh, cannot go into that uh, at this point. So the dependency theories uh, emphasize the class-based nature of the state in uh, capitalist uh, the societies. In the periphery, it argued that uh, the state is controlled by classes whose interests lie in conforming to, uh, to the international division of labor imposed on them by the central countries. Yeah? So the landlords yeah? and, and uh, a small group of uh, industrial capitalists uh, who survive uh, only because uh, the, the government uh, provides a uh, high tariff wall, high uh, protection of uh, the, the tariff, and then allows uh, the, the foreign the companies, transnational companies to come and uh, the invest in alliance with the local capitalists. And these people do not want to, you know, challenge uh, the existing international division of labor. And indeed that uh, we have uh, seen the political dynamic uh, uh, being played again in the last uh, couple of decades, you know, even while there was uh, the so-called pink Thai government in a lot of uh, Latin American countries, the landlord that uh, the class that uh, came back, of course, at the, in the form of agricultural capitalists, but you know, in countries like uh, the, the, the Brazil, that the, you know, dependence on the things like soy and beef uh, has gone up. Yeah? I mean, Brazil has uh, the, the become far more dependent on the, the exporting raw materials uh, like iron ore than the, the exporting manufactured uh, products. Anyway, so I think that uh, these uh, were very important uh, contributions. And indeed, uh, they have uh, left uh, the big impacts, although very few people realize that uh, these are actually legacies of uh, dependency uh, theory. Mm -hmm. And even if they know, they wouldn't admit it. Uh, so, for example, the, the, the these days, uh, the, you know, some neoclassical economists in a very uh, constrained and limited form, but uh, that talk about the, the, the importance of uh, structure. Yeah? The Chinese economist, Justin Lin, who used to be the chief economist of the World Bank, uh, now has a theory called new structural economics. Hmm? And the global value chain, that's uh, straight out of uh, the dependency theory, the discussion of international division of labor. Hmm? You know, neoclassical the, the, the political economy, so-called, the, the, you know, the, the, the so-called theory of uh, government failure also was uh, the, the influenced by the kind of uh, the class-based uh, political economy analysis of uh, dependency theory. 
and, and uh, Marxist uh, thinking. I mean, probably most of the people who write uh, in that uh, the neoclassical version of uh, the, these things that uh, do not realize where the ideas originally came from, but that, uh, you know, uh, that these ideas are still alive. However, if uh, there were only strength, you know, dependency theory would uh, uh, be the widespread and popular these days. Unfortunately, it is not. It is because uh, there were some very important weaknesses. Now, in the beginning, the dependency school flatly denied the possibility of industrialization beyond simple import substitution of uh, consumer goods with uh, low technology behind a tariff wall. Yeah? It was argued that you know, anything beyond that uh, will not be possible. And the only way in which uh, the, the periphery countries can make uh, genuine economic progress is by changing the power structure. Yeah? So you need a nationalist socialist revolution which expels uh, the property owners whose interests lie in perpetuating the existing international division of labor. These were sometimes known as the, the comprador class. And the uh, only when you uh, expel them and that uh, reset that uh, development strategy that uh, uh, is uh, directed towards that uh, pursuing uh, industrialization driven uh, the, by local technologies and financed by local capital, will the periphery countries be able to achieve uh, genuine independent uh, development? Yeah? And in that earlier phase of uh, dependency theory, actually quite a lot of people touted North Korea as an example of independent development. The North Korea, that, uh, which was uh, set up in uh, 1948, like South Korea, the two countries were one and the same uh, until then, at least at, uh, from uh, the, uh, the 13th uh, century, when the Japan the, the was uh, the defeated in the Second World War, the Soviet Union and the United States uh, basically cut uh, Korea into half and installed regimes uh, that uh, they respectively supported. Mm? Now, North Korea the, the pursued this idea of juche. Juche means uh, the self autonomy, self respect. Mm? So basically, it said that uh, we don't want to have anything to do with uh, the capitalist world. We are going to pursue our own economic development using our own capital, using our own uh, technologies. Well, it uh, has been one of the most uh, closed autarkic economies in the world. And it has uh, indeed uh, the, the relied very little on outside uh, capital and technology, especially from the core capitalist countries. But unfortunately, I think that, that the whole project was a fantasy because they may not have attracted that uh, multinational corporations that are from uh, North America and Europe, but it relied heavily on subsidies uh, from the Soviet Union and China. Because that, uh, for example, that uh, when you have uh, a kind of uh, otaki economy that exports uh, very little, where do you earn money to buy oil? They couldn't. So basically they got uh, subsidized oil in barter terms without paying cash uh, from the Soviet Union. When the Soviet Union existed, it uh, was okay. But when it collapsed, they completely uh, destroyed the, 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 that uh, completely destroyed the North Korean economy. This is why they had the Great Famine in 1994, 95, because without Soviet oil, they couldn't even grow food. Yeah? You know, without oil, they couldn't uh, 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 do irrigation. Without oil, they couldn't uh, produce fertilizer. Yeah? 
So the, the, there was a the, the, the great famine there. In terms of technology, North Korea actually did uh, some very cool things. You know, for example, the, the, the very few people know this, but the first ever man-made fiber is uh, nylon, yeah? that everyone knows. Yeah? The second man-made, uh, the second ever the man-made fiber was actually invented in North Korea. Yeah? It's called vinalon, and the raw material is that uh, stone, limestone. Yeah? You know, how cool is that? Yeah? You make uh, literally cloth out of stone. Yeah? So it uh, 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 made some uh, uh, incredible uh, uh, technological achievement, but it's a relatively small and backward economy. How many of those uh, can you do? Yeah? Maybe two, maybe three, but otherwise you are, you are entirely relying on well, what you tell other people are your own technologies, but uh, essentially these are technologies that were imported by the Japanese in the 1930s and, and imported uh, from but, uh, the Soviet Union in the 1950s. Yeah? And North Korea has been reproducing these technologies for decades. Yeah? You know, the, the reality is that without active importation and adaptation of technologies from more economically advanced countries, Developing countries cannot make economic progress. Yeah? I'm not saying that, 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 that you can just that, that import technologies and everything will be fine. You know, that, that sometimes uh, the technologies are of the wrong kind. You know, that, uh, sometimes uh, that the Real Norte había estado reproduciendo uh, advanced countries selling you the technologies might uh, send you only the Kind of, uh, less important part of the technology and you still have to rely on uh, those los countries países for more developed ricos, technologies. So, you know, no I don't want to uh, give you the wrong impression that you, know, you can just start uh, import no foreign technologies and everything will be fine. I mean, the, the point is that you have to first adapt those technologies to your local conditions and then over time have to make those technologies your own. And in the long run, you have to uh, develop your uh, develop the capabilities to develop your own technologies. Yeah? Anyway, the, the, in the 70s, you know, the emergence of uh, industrializing countries in the periphery created uh, quite a big problem uh, for the dependency theory. Yeah? You know, these were known as uh, next newly industrializing countries, NIC, as And uh, yeah, today some uh, people think uh, NICs are only the East Asian countries like uh, South Korea and Taiwan. But in those days, there were three groups of NICs. Yeah? The first group was in uh, Latin America, yeah? Brazil, Argentina, and Mexico. The second group was in East Asia, South Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore. And the third group was actually in the Southern Europe, yeah? Greece, Spain, Portugal, these countries are also called NICs uh, at the time. Yeah? Now, with uh, the development of uh, industrialization beyond the uh, very basic uh, substitution, but uh, in, in the, those uh, NICs, dependency theory had to kind of uh, uh, somehow explain it, and it uh, uh, developed uh, this idea of uh, dependent development. Yeah? So initially they said that, that there will be no development in the periphery. And then they admitted that there could be development, but this will be dependent development. Yeah? These countries might be that, uh, producing cars and that, uh, some more sophisticated uh, products, but these are once again all yeah, from, but, uh, sorry, with uh, foreign technologies, alliance uh, with uh, the multinational corporations yeah? and, and dependent on foreign capital. But uh, even that uh, the version faced uh, difficulties because uh, the, the East Asian NICs, uh, especially South Korea and Taiwan, went much beyond what the uh, uh, dependency theories argued was uh, possible under the, the, the a center periphery relationship. So they that, that went beyond that, that, that dependent development because these countries 
develop uh, capabilities to actually that, that you know generate their own technologies create that, that sorry that climb up uh, the so-called global value chains and then eventually even control the, some of these uh, global value chains themselves yeah? But uh, in the beginning, uh, the dependency theorists that, that try to dismiss the, these experiences because uh, in the beginning, South Korea and Taiwan actually started with very low technology, very labor intensive subcontracting for American and Japanese uh, multinational corporations. Yeah? So they were making uh, t-shirts, you know, they were stuffing toys. Yeah? They, they were the, the, the assembling cheap uh, transistor radios, yeah? cheap TVs. They were making the, the, the trainers, yeah? or, or what the Americans uh, call sneakers. Yeah? At one point, South Korea was actually producing 90% of the uh, world output of Nike. Yeah? So initially they said, oh yeah, these are very shallow, the, the industrialization, you know, the, yeah, they may be growing very fast but that uh, it doesn't really mean much because uh, they're all the subcontracting got, uh, for the rich uh, companies from rich uh, the, the capitalist countries. And also that they try to argue that whatever industrialization that, uh, that was happening owed a lot to the special positions that, that these countries occupied in the Cold War. So the, basically the Americans, I mean, the, at the time, I mean, the, the, there was a the great uh, fear in the 1960s the, the and 70s, there was a great fear that communism will start spread in Asia. And for a while it uh, looked like it, you know, the, there was the Vietnam War between the communist North and the, the, the capitalist South. You know, there were communist uh, insurgencies in the Indonesia, in Malaysia, you know, everywhere. So that the Americans had an interest in the, the promoting development in the, the, their, if you like, client states like uh, South Korea and Taiwan. You know? So dependency theories that, that uh, argued, look at our, these countries are doing well basically because they are getting a lot of help from the Americans. You know? So, you know, the, the, the Americans gave them a lot of foreign aid. Yeah? They gave a special access uh, the, to American the export market, to the companies from the Korea and Taiwan. You know, the, the, they, they the allowed the, these countries to use that the more aggressive industrial policies that it, the, they wouldn't let other developing countries use. So they try to dismiss it uh, by saying that that is all, yeah, that, 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 sorry, that Korea, Taiwan, these countries are that, that exceptionally helped uh, by the Americans. There's some truth in it, but uh, the, it uh, has to be said that, that they are greatly exaggerated. Yeah? In the 1950s, Korea and Taiwan got a lot of foreign aid yeah, from the Americans. But by the 60s, the level of foreign aid in those countries were nowhere that, uh, sorry, that basically average uh, for the world. Yeah? You know, countries like the Philippines, yeah? Chile, they got uh, far more foreign aid uh, from the Americans uh, during the 60s than did uh, South Korea, Taiwan, of course, uh, these are in per capita terms. Yeah? The story that uh, the Americans were giving special access to its uh, export market to companies uh, from Korea and Taiwan, as far as I'm concerned, uh, this is an urban legend. Yeah? I've never seen anyone providing any evidence uh, for this uh, statement. So, you know, uh, I, I am still waiting for the evidence, which hasn't uh, come. Yet, uh, Korea and Taiwan used uh, 
more aggressive uh, trade and industrial policies than are uh, allowed uh, for developing countries today. But you know, it's not as if uh, that uh, they were allowed to use uh, exceptionally strong industrial policy compared to other developing countries of the time. Because at the, at the time, but uh, the, the US was actually a lot more open uh, to the idea of industrial policy and uh, economic planning. Eh? You know, in the, the, the 60s and 70s, the World Bank uh, would uh, run training programs in development planning. Eh? And of course, that uh, not uh, the, the kind of socialist planning, but uh, you know, the Americans were supportive of uh, the, the very high degree of uh, government intervention during the time. And at the time, uh, the, the rules of uh, international uh, trade and investment, uh, the, for example, the, the GATT, the uh, General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs, uh, the rules of uh, GATT uh, regime, which uh, was uh, replaced by the WTO regime, were far more uh, permissive uh, than uh, what we have today. Yeah? Once again, I mean, the, uh, countries like uh, Korea and Taiwan, the, actually that uh, exploited a lot of gray areas in the rules because there were still rules. I mean, uh, much more permissive than today, but you know, the, it wasn't as if uh, the, you could do everything. So the, the, they were quite uh, clever in the, the finding the gray areas. But uh, you know, the, all of these, yeah, I mean, uh, may have had some impact, but I don't think uh, you can explain it, uh, the, uh, explain the su success uh, of uh, countries like Korea and Taiwan that, uh, by talking about this uh, international uh, uh, political factors under the Cold War. But above all, I mean, uh, yeah, may maybe you could doubt that these countries were uh, genuinely developing until the, the maybe the mid eighties, but after that, you know, you you that, that basically have to be blinded by all your own ideology to deny that these countries went well beyond what the dependency theory initially thought was possible for a peripheral country. And in that, uh, making the point that the uh, best example is uh, the South Korean car company Hyundai. I mean, the, you know, a lot of uh, the Latin American countries have uh, Hyundai cars. You know, the Hyundai was uh, initially set up as a joint venture with Ford in the mid 1960s. And for a few years, uh, it assembled the uh, imported uh, Ford cars and sold them in the local market, its uh, annual production during that period was not even 3,000 cars a year. Yeah? And then in the 1973, the South Korean government uh, announces a new development plan for the automobile industry. And it says, we are going to cancel the license of uh, car manufacturers which uh, do not design their own cars. Eh? At the time, there were three joint ventures, uh, one with uh, the Ford, as I said, Hyundai, another with Fiat, another with General Motors. General Motors uh, decided to stick around, but the uh, Ford and Fiat said that we are not interested. Eh? So Hyundai had to design his own car, this uh, small the, the car called Pony, in the first uh, the year of uh, full production, Hyundai produced 10,000 pony cars. In the same year, General Motors alone produced 4.8 million cars. Ford produced 1.9 million cars. Yeah? So Hyundai's uh, car production in 1976 was uh, less than 0.5% at the Ford and less than 0.2% at the General Motors. It wasn't a serious uh, car factory. I mean, it was a glorified car mechanic shop. Yeah? I still remember that I was at the, the, about the, the 12, 13 the, the, at the time. 
You know, in 1976, there's a big headline in the Korean newspapers. Yeah? Korea exports its uh, first cars. Wow, everyone was proud. Yeah? It turned out that we sold six cars to Ecuador. Yeah? You know, <laughs> no one wanted to buy, buy Korean cars. Yeah? I mean, Ecuador was the, the only country who wanted to buy Korean cars. Yeah? Yeah, so that if you look at it at the time, I mean, that, that it was a total joke. Yeah? Now think about it. That if someone took a time machine and went back to 1976 and told people, look, this is a uh, small, new, low-grade uh, the car company in Korea called Hyundai, which at the moment uh, produces 0.2% of what uh, General Motors uh, produces and 0.5% of what uh, Ford uh, produces. But uh, uh, give it uh, the, the 30 years, it will be bigger than Ford. Give it uh, 40 years, it will be uh, bigger than General Motors. You know, people would have uh, that, that, uh, try to put that guy in a mental hospital hmm? because it's uh, such a fantastic uh, story. Hmm? But this is what happened. Yeah? From 2009, Hyundai has been producing more cars than Ford. From 2015, it has been producing more cars than General Motors. Hmm? You know, this is a, a, a remarkable a transformation. Yeah? This is a, something that should not happen according to the dependency theory, even in the, you know, the, the, the second version of uh, dependent development. Yeah? Now, why did it happen? Well, it happened because uh, the, the South Korea, Taiwan, these countries had very strong industrial policy. They uh, gave uh, trade protection to infant industries. They subsidized those industries, sometimes uh, through fiscal subsidies, but uh, very often through loans that, uh, from the sorry, subsidized loans uh, from state-owned banks. You know, between 1961 and 83, all the banks in South Korea were owned by the state. Yeah? In Taiwan, that, uh, until the 90s, almost all the banks were owned by the, the state. Yeah? And they uh, put conditions on the foreign investors, yeah? you know, local contents requirement, technology transfer requirement, joint venture requirement. Yeah? The government uh, that, 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 uh, monitored uh, what kind of technologies are uh, being imported. They put that uh, ceilings on the technology licensing uh, royalties. Yeah? They invested in the research and development. They invested in the, the training. You know, a huge array of uh, policies were used uh, to constantly uh, upgrade the industries of these countries. Yeah? Now, unfortunately, the dependency theories didn't quite uh, that, uh, look at these things uh, because they you know, basically assume that, that something like that cannot happen. Yeah? So paradoxically, they bought into this uh, neoclassical theory of uh, free trade, uh, free market policy. Yeah? Because in the 1970s, the World Bank and the, the, the mainstream neoclassical economists used uh, countries like South Korea and Taiwan to criticize countries in the Latin America and the, the Africa. Yeah? countries that were trying to uh, develop their own manufacturing. Yeah? They say, look at uh, Korea, look at uh, Taiwan. They are growing at uh, three times at, uh, the, the rate uh, that you are growing. Why are they doing it? Because they are using free trade, free market policies. Yeah? And unfortunately, a lot of dependency theories just uh, believe in that. Yeah? Maybe it is uh, kind of convenient to believe in that because that, that in their theory, an independent industrialization cannot happen in a country like uh, the Korea or Taiwan. Yeah, yeah so the dependency theory was uh, a bit like uh, the, what uh, Cambridge uh, the professor, uh, the John Robinson, uh, arguably the 
one of the greatest uh, the female economists who ever lived, said about uh, Joseph Schumpeter. So the Robinson said, Schumpeter is uh, Karl Marx with all the adjectives changed. Yeah? So it's uh, basically the same theory of how capitalism develops through innovation and technological change. Marx says uh, it's a bad thing, but uh, uh, Schumpeter says uh, it's a good thing, but it's the same theory. Yeah? I mean, of course, uh, she was uh, exaggerating, but you know, dependency theory was like that. I mean, that their description, their understanding of uh, the, what was going on uh, in Korea and Taiwan well into the, the, the late 1980s was almost all the, the, the same as uh, what the World Bank was saying. Only the World Bank uh, said this was great, dependent theories that uh, uh, was saying it, uh, this is a bad thing. Yeah? Also, the dependency theory underestimated the extent to which uh, the core capitalist countries themselves did not rely on free trade free market policies for their own development. Yeah? This is uh, the, the, the proposition that I came up with uh, in my book, uh, Kicking at the Ladder. Yeah? So the core capitalist countries like to present themselves as uh, uh, having developed on the basis of free trade and free market. When you actually look at their history, that's the exact opposite of what they did. Yeah? They used uh, the policies like the ones uh, used in East Asia, like the ones in the, the, the ones uh, used in Latin, Latin America to achieve uh, their economic development. Of course, that uh, you have to add to that uh, the uh, exploit, exploitation of uh, the periphery uh, through you know, colonialism and imperialism. But, you know, but uh, that most people don't realize it. Yeah? So dependency theories that, that are also kind of believed in the version of uh, capitalist uh, history that was uh, that, uh, popular because it was uh, propagated uh, by countries with uh, the uh, power. Yeah? Anyway, so the, I think uh, there were these uh, the, the serious uh, problems. Which really came from what I call a teleological thinking, you know, the, this thinking that a theory, you, you know, you know, driving a theory towards a given conclusion, yeah? you know, despite that, 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 some of the greatest insights that, that, that he came up with about uh, the development of a capitalist system, Karl Marx was uh, also quite teleological because uh, he had this theory that everything will eventually lead to socialism. Yeah? And yeah, his uh, followers uh, very often made a mistake of you know, making empirical evidence fit that theory so that somehow the conclusion will always be that uh, there'll be a socialist revolution and capitalism will be replaced. Yeah? I think that the dependency theorists are believing that you know, the, the independent industrialization is impossible in the periphery, kept ignoring evidence that, that, that do not fit their theory. And when they were confronted with that evidence, tried to find other excuses why that, that, that wasn't the case. Yeah? So as a result, uh, the, you know, I, I am totally positive about the, the structural thinking, you know, global systemic thinking that the, the dependency theory that, that was uh, so good at. But the price they paid was that they totally underestimated the agency of countries in the periphery. Yeah? No, you could do it. You could that, that do things that to actually generate independent economic development. It's not easy, but it was done that, that, that to a very high degree in countries like Korea and Taiwan. 
few countries have uh, reached that level, but that, uh, you know, a lot of countries have but, uh, made, you know, at least in some sectors, very significant uh, progress. Yeah? I mean, it's uh, all being treated away these days, but that, uh, you know, Brazil, you know, that, that it that still has that, uh, one of the best that, uh, deep sea oil drilling technologies in the world, you know, it that, that is one of the few countries that can produce that uh, airplanes, you know, it was uh, the pioneer in the, the, the biofuel, you know, that is uh, the alcohol program in the 1970s, you know, I mean, even today, the, at a much lower level, you know, countries like Ethiopia and so on the, have been pursuing some of these things. And yeah, I mean, the, it's all very well to say that, 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 that all of these are structurally constrained and that, uh, historically that, uh, you know, kind of bound and so on, but uh, you, know, the, you have to admit that, that, that what people do matters. Yeah? The agency matters. Yeah? Structure is important. You know, it was that uh, very important to point out that that, that that you cannot do everything that you want. Yeah, but you know that, that you can do things. Yeah, you know that's uh, exactly what uh, the, like uh, what Karl Marx said. Yeah, I mean people make their own history, although not in the context of their own choosing. Yeah? I mean I'm paraphrasing it, but you know. So we have to look at both agency and structure, but uh, unfortunately, I think uh, dependent theorists that uh, gave uh, the insufficient attention to the question of agency. So to conclude, I think the theoretical founded, uh, foundations of dependent theory are, <clears throat> are too valuable to be ignored. Yeah? We need to reformulate and refine the theory. And I think that uh, we, that broadly speaking, have to do three things. First of all, yes, uh, we need to keep the long-term and system-oriented perspectives of dependency theory. But we need to abandon its uh, teleological tendencies and be more open-minded regarding evidence that do not fit the theory. I mean, you know, of course, uh, dependency theory is not, not the only theory that, that has that problem. So, you know, that, don't get me wrong. I mean, that, but, you know, you have to that, that, that be more open-minded that, that about the theory, uh, sorry, evidence that, that do not fit uh, your theory. Secondly, I think it is uh, important to emphasize the role of uh, economic structure, both at, at the global and at the national levels. But uh, we need to better, uh, uh, we need to uh, accept the importance of uh, human agency in determining our country's development path. Yeah? yeah, so the structure sets the boundary of what is possible, but exactly where you end up uh, within that is uh, up to what you do. Yeah? I mean, you, you have to that, that, that accept that, that what people do, namely agency matters. Yeah? I mean, of course, I'm not, I'm not that enough of a political scientist or sociologist that to tell you exactly how this matter, what the, the role ideas play, what role institutions play, but uh, you, know, that you have to that basically accept that agency matters. And only when that, that we accept that, we can find uh, practical solutions. Yeah? Because if you think that, uh, that, that nothing can be done unless the, the structure is uh, completely changed, nothing short of a, rev a, a revolution will uh, change anything. Yeah? And at that, that, that revolution has to be on a global scale because that, that is the, the global capitalist uh, structure that is constraining you. Yeah? So even if you don't like that structure, you, you have to that, that somehow find a way to that, that do certain things, uh, to improve uh, things that, that uh, through your own action. Yeah? I mean, your own action, I mean, of course that, that, that shouldn't be just uh, interpreted as individual action. It should be group action, you know, the, the class, uh, communities, you know, the nations, alliance uh, between the, the countries in the same region, alliance between different uh, developing countries. So that, that by emphasizing agency, 
I do not uh, want to give you the wrong impression that it's uh, only individual agency that is so much emphasized by uh, mainstream economics that uh, that that, uh, that that matters. Yeah. And finally, we need to understand uh, the importance of power issues, both domestic and international, in the way that, that dependency theory emphasized that uh, uh, <coughs> in its uh, formulation. But I think that the problem was that uh, the understanding of uh, power relationship by Dependency theory was uh, too general, too broad. Yeah? I mean, we we that, uh, need to you know, uh, better understand the possibility of grassroots uh, resistance, you know, unexpected uh, coalition building, shifts in the global power dynamics. That uh, all of these things that uh, in order to truly understand what uh, the, how we use the existing power relationships uh, to make changes. Yeah? Because once again, I mean, if you have this uh, very narrow view of uh, the structure of power that is uh, entirely based on uh, ownership of uh, property, then once again, that, that, that socialist uh, revolution is the only solution. Yeah? But even within the, the given power structure, you can that, that do yeah? very the, the clever campaigns that is uh, the, you know, the many, the, especially indigenous communities in the Latin America have shown, you, know, you can build the uh, unexpected uh, coalitions, you know, the, the, who would have thought that, uh, you know, the Latin America was actually the, going to be able to build a coalition for industrialization in the 1930s. Yeah? And yeah, the, make the most of uh, shifts in global power dynamics. Yeah? As a good Korean, I'm not a big fan of uh, the, the China becoming strong because uh, we have been bullied by the Chinese uh, for the last uh, 5,000 years. But, you know, the rise of China is a good thing. Yeah? I mean, the, the, some Latin American countries have but, uh, uh, taken advantage of that and uh, the, the used uh, the, the China as a kind of bargaining chip uh, in, in negotiating things with uh, the, the Americans and the Europeans. Yeah? So, yeah, while I'm all in favor of emphasizing the importance of uh, power relationships, I think it's that, uh, important that, that, that we have a more if you like a flexible and open-minded understanding of uh, power politics. Yeah? Because if you have a very narrow class-based view of yeah. power, then the, the, there's very little that you can do until you have a uh, class-based uh, revolution. Yeah? But power is everywhere, you know, the, the, in terms of, yeah, uh, not just class, but the, the race, gender, you know, uh, and then the, the many other things. And uh, there are many different ways of uh, creating different types of power. And I think uh, that's uh, what uh, the we need to uh, do more research on because I don't think that uh, anyone really has a very good uh, the, the theory of uh, how the power relationships and economic development uh, can be kind of understood uh, as a kind of uh, interactive uh, process. Okay, thank you. I'll I'll uh, stop my speech there, uh, and and uh, thank you to everyone to, for listening. And would uh, to hope uh, to you ask me some questions and make the, the comments and criticisms. Thank you. Muchas gracias, querido Realmente. Thank you very much, dear Hayung. It has been a real pleasure and honor to listen to you with your global perspective in terms of the development theory and the the advances of countries and it's very interesting to analyze the theory of dependency from your perspective so i will try to um to filter the questions that we have and i will refer them to you so you can answer them one by one I think the one interesting question is um, 
what do you think is the importance of what has happened in Latin America during the last 20 years, where as a region, it has managed to reduce inequality. When you, for instance, set the example of Hyundai, who needed 20 years to become developed, from that perspective, and when one analyzes, for instance, what happened in my country, I was able to see what you say about uh, looking for changes in the structure in order to reach development. So when you see that governments or administrations tear apart what has been done so far, even if we change the constitution for uh, state policies, for the sake of state policies, even if we do changes, there is a problem of continuity of policies in order to see a development that needs to last or would last 30 years, for instance. In Latin America, sometimes we feel that we do two steps forward and one step backwards. So what is your experience or your perspective if you compare democracy with development? I think it's a fundamental issue if we look at the recent Latin American uh, history, you know? Thank you, the, the, that's a great question. Yes, uh, I think, uh, I mean, of course, uh, the, the people who control the international media, they are, and, and uh, the, indeed the academia, they are the, the not the very honest about the, the achievements of uh, the so-called uh, pink tide governments, you know, in all of the uh, so-called pink tide countries except uh, in the, the, the case of Venezuela and the, the Mr. Maduro, you know, economic growth has uh, accelerated, not just a little bit, like significantly, and inequalities have fallen compared to the previous uh, neoliberal period. No? So the, that achievement has to be the, the acknowledged. Unfortunately, many of these uh, the achievements uh, that were made uh, on a the basis that is uh, the not very sustainable. No? Because uh, those that uh, the economic growth, those that uh, the reduction in inequality, they lack a uh, permanent basis. No? Because uh, a lot of uh, the growth uh, came from riding on the Chinese, uh, uh, sorry, commodity boom, but uh, fueled by super growth of uh, China until the, the mid uh, 2010s. Yeah? And uh, yeah, countries did that, uh, try to develop uh, new industries and so on, but uh, the, they were not very successful in that regard. And in a case like Brazil, actually the productive uh, structure actually went backward. Yeah? During the pink tide period, uh, Brazil became more dependent on primary commodities than before. Yeah? And because of uh, the, the lack of uh, productive development, job creation that uh, was uh, the, the, not the main the channel through which uh, inequality fell, it was mainly through social transfers. Yeah? But uh, the problem with social transfers is that when the government changes, they can just uh, take it away like that. Yeah? Once you build uh, a viable, the, the high productivity industry, even right-wing government that uh, wouldn't come in and say that we want to abolish this because uh, we don't like uh, that some workers are uh, getting high wages. Yeah? But when it is uh, based on the social transfer programs uh, like Bolsa Familia in Brazil, yeah, they can just uh, take it away like that. Yeah? So I think uh, that was the, the critical weakness uh, of the Ping Thai government. Yeah? It, they just uh, that, that, that didn't 
succeed sometimes uh, because they didn't try hard enough. Yeah, sometimes because that uh, they uh, made uh, political compromise that uh, made uh, active industrial policy impossible. Yeah? But uh, for whatever reason, they failed to make that uh, productive uh, transformation. And the lack of that uh, transformation is uh, at the heart of uh, the, is, uh, the lack of sustainability. Now, some people from that uh, draw the conclusion that uh, therefore we shouldn't uh, uh, have uh, kind of too much uh, democracy so that uh, we can have uh, continuity in the uh, policies. And some of those people often cite uh, cases like Korea and Taiwan, uh, which uh, achieved uh, so-called economic miracle under military dictatorships. Well, I don't know, I mean, that uh, some people in the audience uh, might have, uh, the, the might be old enough uh, to have uh, lived under uh, dictatorships. I'm one of those. You know, I just uh, uh, do not recommend it to anyone. Yeah? We, we really need to uh, defend democracy. And yeah, if uh, that, that, that uh, gives uh, the difficulty in uh, continuing policies, the solution should be creating social consensus uh, through other means rather than you know, trying to somehow uh, uh, suppress uh, democracy. And indeed, that uh, many countries have uh, made uh, uh, dramatic uh, social uh, compromises. Yeah? You know, that, for example, in the 1920s, Sweden had the worst labor relations in the world. Yeah? Officially, it lost the largest number of days in industrial strikes per worker in the world. Yeah? Because that, 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 the workers and the capitalists just that, that, that couldn't uh, agree on anything. And then in the late 1930s, they realized that uh, if they kept doing that, they would uh, both uh, go down the drain. Yeah? So they that, that, that made this uh, big uh, compromise uh, called Zalchevad and the, the agreement in which uh, basically the, the workers agreed to restrain industrial strikes in return for the capitalists uh, investing and uh, the creating jobs yeah? and then paying uh, the more taxes uh, to finance uh, the welfare state. Yeah? I'm not saying that that's the only way of uh, making a compromise, but you know, when that uh, compromise happened, Sweden could uh, that, uh, continue the, the same policy for decades without uh, sacrificing democracy. Yeah? So I, I think uh, that, you know, formal ele elections are important, but uh, that there has to be some attempt to create a social consensus towards a more kind of a transformative uh, the, the policy regime, both in terms of economic growth and uh, in terms of uh, the social and other inequalities. Because uh, that, I just uh, that don't think it's uh, right uh, to you know, sacrifice democracy in the name of uh, the, the policy continuity. Yeah? You know, just uh, think about it. I mean, uh, you might uh, like uh, policy continuity when uh, your policies, are the, the, uh, the policies are the ones that you like, but uh, if it's that uh, policies that you don't like, uh, you don't like uh, the policy continuity. Yeah? So, I mean, uh, we are making very slow progress, but uh, you know, what's uh, going on in Chile, you know, that uh, they have uh, the, been in the process of uh, basically rewriting uh, the social contract. Yeah? I mean, the Pinochet uh, social pact you know, that had been endorsed even by the, the Concertacion, the, 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 the so-called left-wing, center-left uh, coalition, that has been thrown out. Yeah? Of course, it's uh, still a very divided country. You know, um, I don't want to uh, 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 be the overly optimistic, but, uh, you know, that's the kind of uh, thing we need, the uh, rewriting of the social contract, I mean, uh, through debate and compromise. Yeah? That's uh, the only way that, uh, to sustain the, the 
sorry, the create the continu continuity in policy without the compromising on the democracy. Muchas gracias, Shahu. Eh, sí, realmente la democracia es fundamental. Thank you, Yahun, Hayun. Certainly, democracy is fundamental, and no other regime, political regime, should um, should be put ahead of it. One other thing that um, is at stake now is the intellectual property issue. I have been able to participate in a forum between Europe and Ecuador at one point, and one of the proposals sought there uh, was uh, for technological transfer to be put, uh, to be focused by those intellectual property agreements. And in the end, negotiations fell. This led to a deterioration of the balance of payments in the case of Ecuador. So my question is, in what measure do you think the uh, today's um, situation is more favoring of the technological transfer and intellectual property regulations advance when we know that it is now key. We have seen the new treaties between Mexico, Canada, and the United States, and the emphasis they make on patents, the information issue, the industrial design, aspects. Do you think there is still flexibility to implement what the Asian countries have done in this regard and taking into account the power relations that we see today? Whenever there is more emphasis placed on the intangible assets and intangible knowledge, do you think this is a viable uh, move? Thank you. That, that's an excellent question. Well, I think the current regime of intellectual property rights is not even serving the rich countries uh, the, themselves uh, very well. No? Because that, uh, basically you are creating all these uh, the artificial monopolies that uh, gives uh, excessive uh, profit to inventors of uh, the certain technologies. Yeah? But I mean, I don't have time to go into the, 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 the general problem with the system, but uh, you know, a lot of people have argued that uh, the protection is too strong, too long, you know, and uh, it's uh, the, the, uh, now a lot easier to get the uh, pattern or intellectual property right on things that are not very original. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so that, that even for rich countries, the current uh, system of intellectual property rights is uh, the, the, not a good thing. I mean, it's uh, the, the benefiting only a small group of uh, the corporations. Yeah? But when it comes to developing countries, yes, uh, this is a disaster because uh, the, you know something like 97% of all the world's uh, intellectual property rights are owned by individuals and corporations in the rich countries. And uh, the, the developing countries are the, almost always paying for it. And, you know, the, these are countries that need to absorb new technologies, as I emphasized earlier, and strong intellectual property rights is uh, the, making it very difficult, if not totally impossible, for these countries to absorb new technologies, new ideas, you know? So this uh, the needs that uh, reform and yeah, I mean, the, the developing countries have been fighting a lot uh, to change the intellectual property rights regimes. Very little result, but I think 
things, I mean, that I think there's an opening these days because the challenge of climate change and the COVID the pandemic, these two things have focused uh, people's attention on the intellectual property rights system. I mean, if uh, the, the, we are going to save the planet, there has to be very large scale transfer of uh, the, the new energy technologies to developing countries. And most developing countries do not have the ability to develop these technologies themselves. Yeah? They have to come from other countries. Yeah? You know, for other things, you know, the countries with technologies can hold out that they can say, well, the, the, you know, the, we'll give it to you when the, the, these technologies are uh, so common and uh, fall in value. But uh, with the climate change, uh, it's uh, the difficult to uh, make that argument. Yeah? Because that, that, that whatever profit you might make, uh, that, that it will be meaningless if uh, the planet uh, disappears. Yeah? And then the COVID pandemic uh, that uh, showed how unjust uh, this uh, the, the pattern system is. Because you know, okay, maybe the the the, the final uh, but the phase of uh, the research and the trial have been done by profit-making corporations like Pfizer, but uh, in making these vaccines, that uh, huge amount of public money went in. Huge amount of but, uh, research time for non-profit making universities uh, went in. Yeah, and uh, for that reason, the AstraZeneca, the, the British, uh, Swedish uh, the pharmaceutical company who developed this uh, vaccine uh, in alliance with uh, Oxford University, so far has uh, the, the charged, uh, made no profit on the, the vaccine, yeah? uh, now it's not uh, going to charge more, but uh, you know, at least uh, that, that this has shown that it is uh, that, uh, uh, important to recognize that uh, this uh, intellectual property rights system allow a very small group of uh, powerful corporate actors to appropriate contributions of everyone. Yeah? You know, are they that, that, uh, donating money to universities? Yeah? I mean, are they, are they paying back the government for the money they uh, received uh, to develop the vaccine? No, they are not. Yeah? So this is uh, the, the causing a big uh, controversy. So I think uh, there might be some room for revising the, the, the intellectual property rights system uh, the, in this uh, particular juncture. But yes, I mean, I, I think it's uh, very difficult because uh, the, the companies that, uh, that uh, benefit from this system are very powerful. And they have uh, uh, spent huge amount of uh, resources to uh, basically brainwash people that uh, without the uh, uh, intellectual property rights, uh, we'll all kind of uh, uh, go back to the Stone Age, yeah? which is uh, completely untrue. Yeah? Thank you, Professor. Maybe another question, relevant question that you just mentioned, it's related to the relation, this is a student uh, asking Lili Barbosa, the relationship between development and the environment from a standpoint of political ecology in Latin America, there is a lot of democratic awareness especially for the debate of the exploitation of natural resources in order to have the accumulation for development. How do you see that conflict in terms of, like you were saying, the feasibility and the political impact to create a development path when we talk about the nivelation between the stability between economy development and climate, especially what happened in the historical international countries. Thank you. Yes, uh, the, we, I mean, given the urgency of uh, climate action, uh, I think that we really need to uh, focus on how to reconcile the development 
and environment. Now, first of all, there's the issue of uh, historical justice. Yeah? I mean, most of the carbon in the atmosphere has been created by today's rich countries. And it is uh, the, totally unjust uh, for these countries uh, to tell developing countries not to the, the develop their economies. Because that, uh, yeah, even if uh, they didn't do it themselves, that uh, people who live in the rich countries today have uh, benefited enormously from their ancestors destroying the planet. Yeah? I think that, that I mean, there, there, there is uh, some recognition of that uh, in the, the current uh, debate on climate change, but I think uh, there's to be more and the rich countries has, uh, have to do more. Yeah? And indeed, I mean, that, uh, you know, especially given the evidence that uh, beyond about uh, $20,000 uh, per capita income, there's no correlation uh, between a country's income and uh, happiness, you know, makes you think uh, that, uh, that uh, the developed countries, the rich countries need to restructure their economy, including uh, consumption, you know, the, urban planning and, and uh, forms of energy use that, that to create more space uh, for developing countries to develop. Yeah? And secondly, we have to recognize that, that, that for very poor economists, whatever they do, it doesn't uh, really make a difference yeah? because uh, their, their, their carbon footprint is uh, so small that, that, that and, and uh, their level of uh, the kind of uh, development so low that uh, these that it is very urgent for these countries uh, to increase their material production as much as possible in the, the, as uh, the shortest uh, the, the time as possible. Yeah? Now, of course, uh, for them to do it in a the way that is uh, still uh, compatible with the uh, I mean, even though that, that the cumulative impact of their development will be very small, I mean, you know, every little has to count. So, you know, these countries uh, need uh, a lot of uh, technology transfer. And yeah, finally, the, I think, you know, the development and environment that, that doesn't have to be incompatible right? because that, that if you do it with the right technologies, if you do it with uh, the right uh, social the, the, the arrangements, if you do it with the right uh, property rights, you know, the, the basically the trying to make, you know, environmental resources, uh, common property and so on, you know, that the, the economic development doesn't have to, I mean, the, at least uh, to the extent that the, the it does uh, contradict uh, the environmental sustainability. And, Indeed, uh, economic development has to be a part of sustainability package because uh, the, sometimes uh, you know, I, I totally disagree with these people that uh, who believe that uh, technology is the only solution. But you know, sometimes technology is uh, the most uh, effective uh, solution. Yeah? So that uh, we shouldn't uh, the write off uh, the, the technological solutions uh, to environmental problems. And yeah, well, where are those uh, technological uh, conditions uh, going to come from? They will mainly come from the development of the manufacturing industries, yeah? which can make uh, the, 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 you know, machines and create technologies and so on that uh, will help us uh, solve uh, environmental problems. Yeah? I think uh, while there is a conflict between development and environment, I think uh, the relationship is that, uh, quite complex, yeah? because you have uh, the multiple relationships and also the, the questions about the, the historical justice and so on. Okay, let, let me leave it there. Thank you. One more question from Luciana Contiso. How power relationships inhibit the creation of alternative thinking? 
Here, the important thing is, I think, the media that has been monopolized in terms of the construction, the thinking building, like it claims in the book, the that it's not the problem is not the class struggle, but the thinking in the idea and the ideology uh, class clash. So, what's your idea regarding this? Yes, uh, you know, that's a very good question. Uh, well, uh, basically, there are you know different types of power. So there's uh, the physical power, you know, army, police, yeah. This uh, structural power, in the sense that uh, that uh, people who do, do not have uh, independent uh, wealth, I mean, they have to work. Yeah, I mean, that's that uh, that that uh, what uh, Karl Marx, that uh, not only Karl Marx but uh, Adam Smith also said. Yeah. So, yeah, you you may have the freedom to choose your employer, but you do not have the freedom not to work. Yeah. So that uh, that is that uh, power embedded in the economic structure, but you know, in a way, that the greatest uh, power is uh, to make people think uh, what you want them to think. You know, the power to create uh, what Karl Marx called the uh, false consciousness, you know? and in that, media is uh, the most important uh, channel, but also the education system. You know? uh, the cultural norms, I mean, the, all of these things uh, the play a role. So it is uh, important to redress uh, the imbalance of power in uh, between different groups uh, in terms of uh, influencing what other people think. Hmm? So access to media, you know, the the, the right to Kind of uh, the challenge at uh, the, the media uh, if uh, they make uh, the false uh, statement, you know? the the right of the citizens uh, to you know, influence uh, that uh, well to an extent that uh, what is uh, taught in the school. You know? So I think that uh, is. Uh, Important to recognize that, that, that what the political scientists call ideational power, power through ideas, power through ideology, is that, uh, extremely important. And whenever we are that, that trying to rearrange that, uh, our society's uh, power structure, we have to that, that take that, that power very seriously. You know? Unfortunately, that, that, that people have uh, focused too much on you know, class relations. You know? And that uh, uh, economic power, you know, means of production and all that. But uh, you know, ideational power is that uh, so important that we need to that uh, really you know, uh, take this seriously. And yeah, these days it uh, just doesn't mean that uh, you know, uh, controlling TV stations and so on. That you have to uh, control all these that uh, the so-called tech companies, yeah, which are the direct our thinking into certain directions without uh, us even realizing it. And yeah, th there are multiple layers uh, to this, but uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, the role of ideational power is uh, very, very important. Thank you. It's important the construction of ideology and the impact that it has. Here's another question regarding middle class. In your experience and in your analysis regarding the South Korea society, this perspective that it depends on how the middle class was constructed, if it came from industrialization, or workers or exploitation resources or maybe from the state and how they allowed more or less inequality during the development. 
we've seen with several researchers that the role that the middle class play is fundamental and sometimes they are not um, focused on the analysis. What is your analysis on the development economy in Asia or in the world? What other, other views are how middle class play in the economic development? Thank you. Yeah, a lot of people have uh, emphasized uh, the role of the uh, middle class in the democratization, but I think the questioner is very right in the suggesting that not all middle class, not all middle classes are the same. Yeah? And actually, I have a. It's not my area of expertise, but I have a PhD student who is uh, finishing his uh, PhD on this, and he has uh, shown that there's a lot of evidence that uh, there's a strong correlation between democracy and industrialization, but not other forms of economic growth. Yeah? So the particular form of uh, the economic development, particular ways that uh, in which uh, the middle class is generated, you know, whether it's uh, based on exploiting natural resources, you know, rather than the, the, the developing the productivity. And so the, that, that uh, affects uh, the nature of the middle class. So, you know, productive development is important for democracy for that reason as well. You know, there are the, the countries where, you know, there's a big uh, middle class, but you know, the, they don't seem to be very interested in issues of democracy, equality, and so on, yeah? Also, you know, this is uh, just a guess, uh, but uh, the, it depends on what you mean by middle class, yeah? because that, that not all people in the middle are in the same position and in different societies, different bits of the middle class that, that might be the strongest. Yeah? So it might be that in some societies that the upper middle class people who basically uh, the live by serving the interest of you know, uh, big capitalist class like uh, the uh, I don't know the, the lawyers and you know, accountants and bankers and so on. You know that the, these people might be very strong. In others, uh, it might be you know really people in the middle. You know workers you know, working in skilled jobs in factories, as it uh, often was the case uh, in the European countries in the 1950s and 60s. Yeah? Then the, the two different types of middle class would the, the have a very different view on what democracy is, that how we should run society and so on. So yeah, I'm, I'm guessing that, you know, not just that the ways in which uh, the middle class is generated, but also its uh, internal composition and the relative strength of different components of the middle class would uh, have impact on uh, the nature of uh, our country's uh, democracy. Thank you, Hajun. Another issue that was important, and I would like to hear your opinion on this, is Latin American integration. What is the role that needs to be played? Here we have a geopolitical aspect, which is the Trans-Pacific Alliance, which is a proposal of the United States and the one developed during the first years of this millennium, UNASUR, um, CLAC, CEPAL, sorry, that looked for another type of integration. So in this geopolitical structuring, what is your view? What is your thought on the need 
or not of integration in Latin America. Yeah, uh, in general, my view is that uh, economic integration between countries at similar levels of development is a positive thing because they can stimulate with each other, uh, stimulate each other. Whereas uh, economic integration between the countries at different levels of uh, the development, while I don't reject uh, the, the, it uh, like uh, some dependent theorists are used to, I think uh, the, that relationship uh, is uh, much more complicated. Yeah? I mean, you need to design it well that uh, for the uh, poorer countries uh, to benefit uh, from the relationship. Yeah? Anyway, so that, uh, yeah, in Latin America, the, you know, you have a range of uh, the, the income levels, you know, the, but the, the broadly speaking, uh, at least in South America, the, the level of development is uh, the, relatively similar to each other. So, the, and, and it, the, the, the continent shares uh, the historical, cultural, linguistic uh, legacies. Uh, so yeah, I think uh, there is a uh, obvious uh, benefit uh, to be derived uh, from uh, integration of the region. But then, you know, that's only at the broad level. You know, the Brazil's uh, that uh, much bigger than yeah anyone else. That uh, unless uh, you draw in the uh, Mexico, which is already integrated with uh, the United States, that uh, the, 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 there'll be no one to uh, check Brazil. So that's uh, one concern. Yeah. Uh, also, that uh, <laughs> unfortunately, Brazil itself is uh, going backward. So, are you that that uh, going to that uh, you know form alliance with uh, the an economy that's uh, that uh, fundamentally going the wrong way? That you know that shouldn't you seek uh, partners in other parts? You know that so that uh, you need to that. that uh, uh, ask that uh, question too. But yeah, I mean, the, the, I can clearly tell you that uh, things like TPP, the, the, you know, which uh, tries to link Latin America with the, the, uh, Japan and uh, the US and so on, I mean, that's, I mean, the, not going to be the positive. Yeah? I mean, the, that kind of uh, the integration has uh, the, always uh, benefited uh, the stronger countries and uh, the things like uh, regional agreements, uh, so-called like uh, TPP the, that involve uh, the rich and the poor countries, they tend to be far more restrictive on national policy autonomy than the WTO is. Yeah? So the, 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 it's uh, clearly something that Latin American countries uh, should go into, although some countries are very keen to do that. Yeah? So uh, let's uh, leave it there. Thank you very much, Professor. Another important issue for Latin America is the recent relationship he has um, tried to establish with China. Lastly, the focus has shifted from trade and imports of primary commodities to industrial imports. So from the perspective of the theory of dependency, how, can, how do you see these two kinds of relationships? And uh, in comparison also with the relationship with the United States, can it be beneficial? Or is this a new structural problem that Latin America will have as a region in terms of the global geopolitics? Yes, uh, well, in terms of overall level of development, you know, China is uh, still a relatively poor economy. I mean, it's, uh, you know, per capita income is uh, about $10,000, you know, 
similar to that of Mexico, you know, lower than that of uh, Chile, uh, not much higher than that, that of uh, most other Latin American countries. Uh, but yes, I mean, China is at, uh, quite unique in that, you know, that $10,000 average highs huge variations in the level of development. Yeah? So some part of China could be in the 22nd century. There are still, on the other hand, hundreds of millions of people who are finding it difficult to meet their basic need. So China is that are far more complicated than other countries. That's one. But secondly, yeah, I mean, uh, compared to the United States uh, or Europe, I think that uh, China is that, uh, still closer to the Latin American countries in the terms of uh, its uh, level of development and also its uh, polity more open to its uh, partner countries using alternative policies, yeah. Yeah, maybe that 20, 30 years later, it will change its mind and try to impose its own model. But so far it has been more open to countries uh, that, that are pursuing their own uh, uh, development strategies. Oh, I have a feeling that uh, there's a connection problem, but can you hear me? Yeah. Sí, muy bien, okay. muy bien. Yeah, muy bien. Okay. Sí, sí. Okay. Yes, uh, perfectly. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so the collaboration with the China will be less negative uh, than collaboration with uh, the United States or Europe. But I don't know, I mean, that, that people are rightly worried about a new dependency relationship developing because that uh, China's main interest in Latin America is basically as a source of uh, the natural resources. And, you know, that we, we have a kind of a feeling that this might recreate uh, the relationship uh, that Latin America had with uh, especially the United States uh, and also Europe in the past. So I think that, that, that the worry is justified, but you know, once again, that, that we have to take uh, agency seriously. Yeah? So if you are selling natural resources to China, okay, in the short run, I'm not going to criticize uh, you know, the, the Latin American countries that are digging out more, I don't know, the lithium or the, the, you know, growing more soy that, that to make uh, more export earning, but when you are uh, dealing with China, you have to have a longer term strategy. I mean, are you going to make China transport technologies? Eh? Are you going to uh, insist on uh, forming joint ventures? Eh? Are you going to uh, uh, make China uh, but, uh, more open to kind of uh, preserving uh, biodiversity uh, in Latin America? Eh? So I think that uh, once again, that, that you know, some of these economic forces are not completely under your control, but there are things that you can do to make uh, that relationship more productive, at least uh, less harmful. Yeah? Unfortunately, I don't see the, a lot of uh, the, the strategic thinking uh, going on in Latin American countries in terms of its uh, relationship with uh, the, the, uh, with uh, China, and I really that I think that uh, that has to be the, the something that uh, the you take uh, more seriously because if you, you, know, you could yeah I mean it's not going to be totally unalterable but it uh, could take uh, decades uh, to change it yeah. If you can do certain things to make sure that this that the relationship 
goes into the right direction of uh, the mutual benefit and uh, the technological catching up, uh, productivity growth, then I think that uh, it will be the, the much better the, the in the long run. Quizás una última pregunta de los estudiantes que se refieren principalmente. Maybe we can address one last question from students regarding the fact that development most of the times depends on or relies on financing and is sometimes and most in most cases subjected to uh, international institutions such as the IMF. So what is your what is your understanding of the other options options of financing besides these institutions and the proposal for a new financial architecture in the region also to to wrap up Hayun uh, there's another question about industrial policies should they be emphasized in sectors with more research and development? Those would be the last two questions. Sorry, my internet was uh, unstable, so I didn't second question. Yes, I will repeat the last question. Yeah. Do you think industrial policies should focus on emphasizing those sectors with more research and development? Thank you. Yeah, on the first uh, architecture well i'm not really a great expert on that issue you know you should uh, ask the people like jose antonio campo or stephanie griffiths jones but uh, yeah i mean the the, the international financial architecture is uh, the slowly changing you know that, that we have the uh, in addition you know in the 1980s and 90s there was only one bank in town that which was called world bank yeah if you that, uh, didn't like the World Bank, if uh, the World Bank didn't like you, finito. Eh? I mean, that, that, that you had no uh, choice. Eh? Now you have uh, the Bank of the South, uh, you have the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, uh, you have uh, all the others, yeah? uh, the new in the financial institutions. Also, the prestige of uh, the World Bank and the IMF have uh, fallen quite a lot because they made such a uh, mess of things. So I think that uh, now that uh, we may be seeing the beginning of a uh, new international uh, financial architecture. Yeah? And also there have been uh, a lot of uh, developments at the national level. You know, a lot of countries have set up a uh, national development bank and, you know, uh, things are that are moving in a new direction. So yeah, let's hope uh, that all of these uh, changes over time result in a new international uh, financial architecture. I mean, it will be a big uh, struggle to, uh, to uh, make a new one that is good because you know, the countries with money, they are just too powerful, and uh, unless uh, that is a concerted action by all the developing countries in the manner of you know, known online movement in the past, that uh, no big change is going to happen. Huh? Uh, should industrial policy focus on research and uh, sectors with uh, strong research and development? Well, it depends, you know, ideally, yes, but, uh, you know, the, the basically, different industries have to play different roles in your economic development. Yeah? So if you are a relatively uh, economy, 
you know, even if you want it, that uh, it will be very difficult to engage in with uh, high research and development. Research and development cost a lot of money. On the other hand, that that uh, in the long run, uh, if you want to increase your ability to conduct uh, research and development, you need to have a good uh, export industry. Because unless you earn foreign exchanges, uh, that will allow you to buy you know, the advanced technologies at, uh, from uh, economically more advanced countries, you are not going to the, the, the even come near those at the, the R&D intensive uh, productive uh, sectors. Eh? So, you know, in the short run, you might have to focus on low tech industries that will give you the, the greatest uh, foreign exchange. But yeah, I mean, the, the important thing about the industrial policy, you have to have a long-term vision. Yeah? You know, South Korea, Taiwan, these countries started with the lowest, the cheapest, the most labor-intensive industries because they didn't have any natural resource to export. And they needed the foreign exchanges if they wanted to buy machines and technologies. Yeah? So what do you do? You that, uh, make your workers uh, work uh, 14 hours a day. Yeah? You know, you, that, uh, you, you that, that, that make them uh, work even on Saturdays. Yeah? But what uh, that those countries did right was to continuously move up the value chain, if you like, you know, by continuously investing in building new industries with the higher tech research and development. Yeah, so there are other countries which have the great processing zones uh, like uh, the, the Philippines and uh, Sri Lanka, but they still have uh, only three, four thousand dollar per capita income despite having been engaged in export uh, processing for the last uh, 30 years, 40 years, yeah? because they don't have the industrial policy to use those uh, foreign exchanges to develop a better industries. In the long run, you should uh, develop the high productive industries, uh, high technology industries, which are going to do a lot of research and development. But until you get there, you might, that uh, you will need uh, more pragmatic strategies of you know, starting with the easier industries, moving up, you know, upgrading, and then eventually that, that, that moving to the high tech industries. Thank you. Bueno, eh, realmente ha sido un placer escucharte, estimado Hayun. Hemos aprendido muchísimo. Hayun, it has been a real pleasure to listen to you. We have learned a lot. I am certain that it is nece necessary to um, set to, to address the debate in Latin America, focusing on the new issues and challenges, the potential aspects, and also focusing on the global perspective of the history of other countries, which can lead us to um, to focus on the on the flaws and and the lessons learned. We also the importance of focusing on the long term to that, that it is fundamental in Latin America to have a proper structure that lays the foundation for development. Once again, I would like to thank you for sharing your global perspective with us. We have had hundreds of students participating and we will continue to advance in the other several questions that we have in terms of research in this topic. So thank you for your presence. And I would also like to thank the interpreters, Daniela Caballero and Clara Campero, who have worked very hard to interpret this talk. So uh, we are able to communicate with each other. 
Latin America has been able to hear you. And it's been once again, a real pleasure and an honor for you to set the pace and establish the foundations for this network we are trying to build. Thank you and congratulations. Mm -hmm. Hola chicos, todo perfecto. Ya estamos fuera de aire. Excelente. Gracias, nos vemos más tarde. Gracias, muchas gracias. Nos vemos en un claro, rato. Claro, muchísimas gracias, Daniela. Obviamente a cada uno de los estudiantes, doctorado, los docentes que están por atrás. A René, no sé si ya salió. Y a nuestro sí. disertante. Bueno, y ahora bueno. también a todos los compañeros de, y colegas de la DRIC que estuvieron en la parte técnica. Sé que van a hacer un, una pausa ahora para comer porque a las tres seguimos. Bueno, Salud. muchísimas gracias. Gracias a ustedes.